every lockdown we hear stories about wage subsidies and business payments and different tools that the government provides to make sure that businesses are ticking over since there's obviously no customers at the moment, everybody's locked up at home. But when you're dealing with a not-for-profit group where your costs go up exponentially during a crisis like this but you're funded in advance, there's a whole bunch of other challenges that come into play and tools like the wage subsidy aren't available to you. I sat down with Community Waikato Chief Executive Holly Snape and we had a chat about some of the challenges that are affecting different groups at the moment, particularly not-for-profits, as well as quite a bit there on animals because she loves her animals and she's absolutely fantastic with them as well. So if you are a person who wants to know a bit more about not-for-profit groups and how to handle something like a lockdown or a COVID outbreak, or you're just an animal lover and want some tips on what your animals are going to be going through during lockdown, enjoy the following episode. So tell me, how busy have you been? Well, we've been, um, yeah, terribly busy at work. Um, yeah. But that that's common under crisis or lockdown situations we've found. Yeah. Um, partly it's the work that we normally do with community organisations that doesn't stop. We just do it remotely. Um, but uh, combined with that, we tend to get um, new types of work, so um, more infrastructure support across the sector. So we've been helping with things like the regional food response. That, yeah, makes, that sense, makes sense, yeah. Um, how, how many of the people that you work with have asked for things like, like how does the wage subsidy work or the, the payments that the government's sorting out? Like, um, how, how does it actually come into play with you guys and, and with, it with doesn't, organizations? It's, it's, it doesn't really um, impact a lot of not-for-profits, certainly the small ones as well. And, and actually, there's a frustration for us around this in that um, the wage subsidies are applied to businesses and organisations who experience a 40% loss in income. Most of our organisations are funded in advance through grant funding and contracts, mm -hmm. for example. So up the front, we don't have that immediate loss. The sting in the tail comes later for us. Um, so, so that's a little bit frustrating because the system doesn't really work to meet the, the needs of the not-for-profit sector. So, for example, food providers have um, experienced significant increase in the amount of work, but they don't have a significant increase in the personnel who are able to deliver that mm -hmm. work. And there isn't sort of the same kind of opportunity to access subsidies or financial support to increase the um you know the, the teams to be able to meet increased pressure and yeah at work so if that makes sense it's kind of like for us yeah. it's it's the other way around yeah yeah you, you're going into it you're fine but you don't really know how it's going to yeah. end but we don't but also going into it we have um more work on um we haven't had a loss in income because that's not kind of how the not-for-profit sector works, but we have had increase in costs. And that's going to hurt. Yes, yeah. yes, because, of course, in the not-for-profit sector, we don't get funded retrospectively. Yeah. So it's very difficult. You can't go to funders and go, oh, actually, we had to do a whole lot of extra stuff. Can you pay us for what we did last month? That's not how the funding environment works. No. So it, it, it's just a nuance um, that we're aware of, and um, yeah. <laughs> was that something that sort of you, you knew going into, say, the first lockdown last year, or was it something that you sort of you got it, through it and got, went, "Oh well, crap! This is some. This is the new reality." Yeah. It's something that became evident really quickly in the first lockdown, and those are conversations that we were having in um, places with funders. And they're aware of that as a situation as well, and certainly. Um, the sector has um, had access to more support through MSD and the likes with a number of COVID funds that have, have come about. So that will have certainly provided some support um, for organisations because it's, it was unexpected money that became available after lockdown. Yeah. So that will have that will have helped, particularly because a lot of um, you know, some of that funding anyway could be applied to the back office costs. And that's often the stuff that we find most hard to get. Yeah. Um, fun, yeah. So a, a lot of well, some, not a lot, but some not-for-profits obviously pay people for specific roles like management roles or, or admin Absolutely. roles and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, do you know what the uptake's been on on things like the wage subsidy for those groups? Like, uh, uh, is that something that they're definitely looking That's, into? Yeah, they're the groups that I've sort of been talking about, really. And so the wage subsidy doesn't apply because we don't meet the criteria of a forty percent loss of income, even though oh. we might have had a forty percent increase in expenditure. How does that work then for something like 
and I use the term really lightly here, taxpayer union, where they are basically a, a, a right-wing think tank astroturfing mm-hmm. group, but they're yeah. able to claim it. Uh, like, like yeah. they, they don't have an income that I could see or, or something that would be yeah. considered a regular income. We we could probably claim it as well. It doesn't mean we're necessarily um, uh, that just because we claim it doesn't necessarily mean that we can claim it, if you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah, because um, it's very much a we'll give you the money now and ask questions later right. process. Exactly, and we can't afford to be handing hundreds or thousands of dollars back should it yeah. turn out <laughs> that we don't meet the criteria. And the reality is that when we look at our organisations and, and what happens financially with us, we don't expect we will meet the criteria. So most organisations are not um, seeking a wage subsidy at all. There will be some that do, and they are ones that um, rely on enterprise as a um, stream of financial support for the organisation. So a number of organisations that have large um, op shops okay. will be able to apply for wage subsidies, and, and those organisations, I'm sure, certainly take it up. Um, but the vast majority of us aren't really in that position and certainly don't have untagged incomes from enterprise that are quite in the vicinity of, of 40% of the income. <laughs> yeah. And 40% is a big drop. Like it's a yeah, massive it drop. It, yeah, it, it, absolutely. When you don't have an economic outcome measurable like that, like mm. it, when, when you're off working at the nonprofit helping people, for example, you can't turn around and say, oh, we've had a 40% drop in the number of people that we've helped. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Is this something that the government has has turned around at any point in the last 18 months and gone, well, it's a loophole we need to fix or it's something we need to be aware Um, of? No, not at this point. And we intend to keep having these conversations to make sure um, government and those who are making some of those decisions are aware of the nuances of the not-for-profit sector. Because, of course, um, this is a sector that is often called on the most during times of crisis. You know, so um, so absolutely, I think that needs to be um, consideration needs to be given to uh, to not for profits, and I think that was partly the MSD fund, the COVID response fund, is yeah. um, is partly you know to to do that. Um, although, if you look at the criteria of the fund, it doesn't necessarily. It's, it's not quite all it needs to be. It, it does feel, it's some of these things, and I know it, it's probably the case, they've made it up as they've gone along because they've needed to. Look, exactly. And I totally exactly. get and it. I think, yeah, I, 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 I totally agree. I think that's absolutely fair. And, and what we want to do is work constructively um, with those people making those decisions so that they're aware of um, what works and where the challenges still lie. So in Hamilton, you've got two Labour MPs. And last I heard, they were the majority of the, of the House at the moment. Have you had a chance to talk to them about this? Have, have you reached out to them or have they reached out to you? Um, no, at the moment when we've been in meetings together, it's been in things like um, the Kai Collective when we're talking about community response. So it's really about um, trying to do the best we can, you know, at grassroots level. Um, I think the infrastructure conversations will probably come a little later when we start doing reflecting. And I do sit on the um, GECC or GEEC, which is essentially the, (laughs) um, (laughs) it's the government um, entities um, that are involved in any kind of emergency response. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I I sit in that group and it is an opportunity to feedback. And I will certainly be having some of these conversations once we're in a debriefing position. Because you, you start level two today, don't you? Um, we are in level two. That's, and here I'm, I am at home. I'm so I've just, jealous. I've just come back from Free FM. I've recorded a show. Nice. Uh, in the studio. So that the, was old, the, the old fashioned way. The old fashioned way. It's so nice. I mean, you have, I was going to say they have a microphone in your face, but you've got one at home. Uh, so Yeah, I, I, I got this one for free. I was very lucky when I was working at JCAR. It was the last of the models and the regional manager was basically, uh, here you go. I don't want it on the shelf anymore. Take it. It was about $300 worth. Oh, so very I'm, nice. I, I, I wasn't saying no. So it makes no. me look fancy, but it's... It does. It's, you look yeah, very fancy. It, fancy. Just, it, it just does the job more than anything. Yeah. Um, so for, for us who are stuck here in level four, uh, is it life back to normal? 
you know, you, when you're out and about in the streets, you know, driving places, it feels like life's a little bit back to normal. But as soon as you walk into a venue, you realise it's not. People are masked up. People are trying to stay socially distanced. It feels, it, it feels like that, you know. Um, I think this is going to last quite a bit longer. And, and that coming out of the levels is going to feel like it lasts longer. Um, yeah. So it's nice to be able to go into a shop and, you know, grab. Nice I was trying to grab. Yeah, I was trying to grab net curtains because my cat's tore <laughs> net curtain like the first week of lockdown, and I've had yep. this big gaping hole oh, that looks terrible. It faces the road. You know, it just looks terrible. And so, so, so I thought I'd fix that, but I can't. They. Oh, um, I grew up in a house with a lot of cats. Mum's always been a collector of cats. Um, I, because she works at a vet clinic part time, and it's always oh, this little kitten's got nowhere to go. So it, it, it would sort of end up in the collection. One of the first yeah. things I remember her saying is, "If you get cats, you don't have nets. Like it's, it's the two just don't go together." The, the cats like the nets. Yeah, that's part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. So how many cats I've, have you got now? I've only got two, so okay. I feel like that's a sensible number of yeah. cats. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Dogs. I've only got one dog at the moment, but I must say um, I've been getting, you know, people get clucky for babies. I've been yes. getting clucky for puppies. And so I've been looking daily <laughs> um, and just waiting for the right the well, right pup to join the family. Puppy season must be coming up. It's almost spring. Yeah. Yeah. Puppies have, um, like dogs actually have two heats. Um, so they've actually been yeah. puppies, you know, through this whole time as well. Yeah, but yes, we will find again. There'll be a bit of an influx, I think, <laughs> yeah. um, relatively shortly, just before Christmas, probably. That, that sounds yeah. like a perfect Christmas present. Oh, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> and then I've got a birthday, so if we miss Christmas, there's always my birthday. Exactly. There's plenty of opportunities yeah. to expand the family there. Exactly. What, what? Last time I was at your place, you had, I think, you had rabbits there as well. I don't have any rabbits. Okay. Yeah. What do you um, have at I the moment? Have um, I've only got the two cats and the dog at the moment, and, okay. and I foster animals at times. So, okay. but little four and three haven't haven't been fostering basically through okay. the yeah. So the, they haven't brought new fosters into the shelters. Oh, that makes sense. Do you know yeah. what sort of challenges actually level three and four throw up for fosters? Because obviously you can't go in and meet people and no, pick up animals no, and. Yeah, so I think that's really difficult. And it's um, exacerbated if you've got a young dog that's at a stage where it really needs to be socialised. Yeah. You know, there's a relatively short window of that kind of key socialising period where you get the most gains. And that's between around eight and um, sort of 16 weeks. Um, and, of course, puppies aren't fully vaccinated until after 12 weeks as well. And so that, you know, there's a whole lot of challenges. But um, it, it certainly makes things tough, um, A, when shelters are unable to have people come through so it, it means that they have to say no for new dogs coming in or new puppies coming in mm -hmm. um it means that people with fosters tend to just have to hold that foster for a period of time and that for the young dogs who really need to be out and about and kind of exploring the world and meeting other dogs and doing those things um there are a lot of limitations on that and that can um, translate later on into some fears or challenges for the dogs as they're um, navigating a world outside of that period, that socialising period. Have you come across any examples of, say, the first lockdown? Because I keep thinking you guys have only had two lockdowns. I'm on my fourth That's one now. Um, oh, you're an old hand at this. Uh, yeah, I'm getting used to it. Just, just yeah. stay home and you, you blob out to Netflix. <laughs> it's perfect. Um, have you come across any examples of people who didn't realise that at the time with the first lockdown that, that there would be issues socialising animals afterwards? Um, I think people kind of tried to just make the best of what they had. Um, I mean, I must admit, um, I don't think I realise how many people have dogs in my neighbourhood because when I'm out walking and, and about, yeah. certainly there are lots of people out and about with their dogs. What they can't do is interact with each other yeah. under levels four and, and three. Um, I suspect not everyone followed those rules. <laughs> yep, I <laughs> would agree. Kind of anyone in it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but certainly I've heard anecdotally a number of vet clinics um, and behaviourists talk about um, seeing increased issues with um, 
anxiety and with um, fear-based um, reactivity in, in dogs and in puppies. And I would expect that that is related to um, that lockdown. So um, separation sense. anxiety, yeah, separation anxiety became a bit of an issue for a number of dogs too, where suddenly people were at home all the time and dogs were like, yeah, this is how life's meant to be. And then all of a sudden they left for eight hours again a day. And um, a number of dogs haven't coped well with that transition kind of out of lockdown. Yeah. It, it must be so tough for them. I, 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 not being a pet owner myself, I, I went for children instead, which was a terrible mistake. Yeah. They're far more expensive and <laughs> they eat way more, make much more mess. Yeah. Um, but, but They do give you grandchildren, they don't they? Yeah, that's very true. And the grandkid is very cute. He's adorable. Yeah. But I can give him yeah. back. So that is true as well. That's the best thing about grandkids. <laughs> Uh, but I, I've found with, with them, it's fine people being home, they get used to it because they're children. They like having people yes. around. Um, for dogs, okay, even walking down the street and seeing another dog and not being able to interact with it, that must be, yeah. that, that goes against every instinct that they've got. Yeah, it does. Although in saying that, um, a, quite an important skill to teach your dog is that it doesn't get to approach every dog that it sees. Um, and, and that's quite important because not every dog wants to greet every other True. dog as well. So, so teaching your dog some self-restraint is actually a really good thing. Um, I think the problem is that not everyone necessarily has the tools or the experience um, on how to train their dog to ignore another dog or to focus on you as you pass that other dog. So what they end up doing is um, pulling on their lead and yanking their dog away from the other dog. And that in itself can actually potentially um, create a reactivity. So they see, a, I'm going to call it a, tr a trigger, but mm -hmm. something that excites them or, or scares them, one or the other. So they see something that, that changes their emotional response. And then they get um, yanked um, by the neck or, you know, pulled away, and, yeah. and that's quite an aversive feeling, um, and that can end up, um, sorry, my dog's about to bark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just wants to get involved. <laughs> the boy. Um, yeah, so that can end up creating a, a fear response and then um, develop into a reactivity when they see other dogs, and people would call that like a dog-on-dog -dog aggression. It's actually often um, a lead-associated Okay. Um, aggression and it's an it's a fear response a, a reactivity rather than a, a true aggression i've noticed it a bit around here because across the road I, my neighbors have a big um i think it's a collie over there that, that likes to yeah. bark loudly when people walk past and likes to be the center of attention but yeah. you've got Sounds other like people fun. walking down the street with their dogs on yeah. leads and it's just yes. an instant yank as soon as one of the dogs start to bark at each other it just yeah yeah it doesn't sound like, a, like i so get why they're doing it yeah. Oh, look, it, it's, it almost feels like the response you want to do. Yeah. You know, and, and especially if you see a dog and it's running, it goes to run at your dog, pulling it back feels like the thing you, you want to yeah. do. But but really, it's not the most constructive response. And um, and probably the key, you know, if, if we're just going to do a little dog training thing here, <laughs> the, the key fine. is to actually... <laughs> <laughs> to practice this stuff before you have a problem. And that can sound a bit weird, um, you know, and, and how do you actually do that? But um, there are things that if you take your dog out and about, I always have heaps of treats on me all the time. I train everything with rewards. Um, I will call my dog back to me constantly. So he'll just be walking and sniffing and enjoying things and I'll, I'll reward him for doing that and I'll call him to me and then he'll come back around. I'll reward him. So that by the time we see another dog, now I like to um, respond well before my dog's reacted to that other dog. Mm -hmm. I'll start calling him to me and I might put him in a watch. You know, so I get him to look at my face and we might do some heel work. I might do a scatter feed on the ground. Um, a scatter feed is particularly good for a dog if the other dog is um, being quite reactive. If it's a bit further away, so the other side of the street, maybe it's barking or a bit lungy. A scatter feed's really good because it, um, the dog, your dog ends up sniffing for the treats. Um, sniffing is a, um, it, it's a relaxing sort of behavior. It's a calming behavior. Okay. It also calms the other dog. So when they, they, because your dog no longer looks like a threat. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It sort of yeah. de-escalates de the situation a bit for everybody. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. Do, do you find, or have you come across a lot of people who didn't realize how much work needed to be done with their dogs? After I lockdowns? think um, 
not so much me, but but I think the the shelters absolutely um, have found that. Um, I think that's extremely frustrating for people. I think um, dogs look where well, they look easy, and when they when they've been well trained, it, it looks like it's the simplest thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and to some degree. You know, it's it's not difficult. A lot of it's actually quite logical once you've got um, the the basics sort of down. But I think um, I think what's difficult is consistency for people, and especially if you've got kids. It's actually really hard to be consistent if you've got kids. Like, oh, yeah. oh we don't feed dogs from the table until you've got a kid. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. so so I think that that can be um, really challenging. Um, and can then make it quite hard to get consistent behaviours. You know, things like um, dogs jumping up on people, you know, children and, um, you know, children and people like myself can sometimes encourage that behaviour. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. That, that makes sense. I, I think people often forget, like, being in a lockdown situation, you, you sort of sit there going, okay, cool, you know, I'm home, I've got food, I've got the yeah. animals. Like they, they, they sort of take stock but they don't realise just what's involved in going out and looking after them at the same time and making sure yeah. that like, we, we need to go out and get exercise for our own mental health. It's absolutely the same for the animals yeah. that we're with. Oh, absolutely. And it's not just physical, it's mental. Um, you know, Espen, my dog, has um, he usually goes to university two days a week where he's sent in for invasive. Yeah, he is. <laughs> smarter than me. So he's, um, <laughs> he's been learning to send for invasive fish species. Oh wow! Uh, but it's, yeah, he's doing it's, he's doing well considering he's he's a new kid on the block and he's actually already progressed to real world samples. Um, some days he's great at it, but other days he's absolutely appalling. But it's, I feel the same about most things I do. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it, regardless, it's a hugely enriching behaviour for him. It really stimulates his brain. Now we don't have that during lockdown, and I take him out for an hour's walk every day. Um, you know, took twice a day if I can. Um, But what I have been doing, particularly when the weather's poor, is just I teach him new tricks. So at the moment, we're doing um, this trick where he's learning to put his nose inside my hand um, and he has to hold it there. So at the moment, we're trying to extend the hold. He just keeps coming trying to flick my hand at the moment and (laughs) get the trick and flicks it with his nose. But um, eventually that will turn into me lifting his lip um, and then it will turn into me brushing his teeth. Okay. we're just creating a, a series of activities to to build his confidence and that I can undertake a, a health, you know, <laughs> a health activity with him. Um, but we're breaking it down into a series of yeah little exercises. And it's great because it's massively stimulating for his brain, trying to figure out what it is I want him to do, like to come up to me, put his muzzle in my hand and then um, hold it there. Yeah. Um, and yep. the next thing I want to do now that I'm out of lockdown is I'm going to buy a bell and I teach him to ring a bell. Oh, that's so, cool. Yeah, it'd be fun. Yeah. yeah. I think you'll be looking forward to it. Yeah. All these new yep, things absolutely. to do. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, in terms of the not-for-profits with animals, do you know how much they've been hit by lockdowns in ter- financially? Like, has there been I much? A lot of... A lot of um, not for profit animal you know organizations rely on a lot of op shops <laughs> so yeah. um and, and fundraising so you know out and about with buckets and those types of activities and they have been really impacted those activities have been impacted by covid um and that will have quite a long term um impact i think as well i don't know what the stats are like in terms of people returning to some of those places um but we do know that out of lockdown, it appears to be around a month before people start turning up to um, kind of events. So even yeah. out of lockdown, it will take a while before those fundraising events are even an option. And of course, they have costs to organise as well. And I think that there are still fears that people have that we go ahead and organise something to have it cancelled. You know, are we able to bear that cost if that happens? So I think that that those are some considerations that those sorts of groups are having to take into account at the moment. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's yeah, that 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 same thing is impacting lots of different organizations. The amount of conferences that, you know, have been cancelled. Yeah. And all of those have costs. And again, the things that are for a not for profit are really hard to have covered. Um, I must say though that our funders have been extremely understanding. 
Um, so, so I think that that's really helpful. We're at a point, Community Waikato are looking at um, next year holding our um, our conference. So we we do it biennially. Um, we missed a year because we were concerned about COVID. So we're looking mm-hmm. at doing it next year. Um, but we're having to have some hard conversations about what happens um, if we book a venue and then we're no longer able to run. Like, so we need yeah. we need venues to be really clear about what their cancellation policies are. And we need our funders to be really clear that um, we can't absorb a financial hit. We don't have untagged money for, for this. So um, we need to know our funders would be willing to take a risk if they want to fund this event. So those are some really hard conversations to have. And it's not something that 18 months, two years ago would have even been a consideration. No, not not anywhere to the degree. We always had that concern, oh, if we didn't get an, an, the numbers, we might have mm-hmm. to, to cancel. Um, but we've never really thought there might be a, a national event. <laughs> <you know? laughs> International. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That that would stop us from being able to go forward with this. So, yeah, um, so those are the sorts of things we're needing to think about now because we also think that the opportunity to bring people together um, is actually really important. And particularly in the not-for-profit sector, we're very people-focused. So, um, and and we also need, the, we don't have a lot of opportunities to um, really collaborate and cross-pollinate. And so this is a, a wonderful opportunity to slow everyone down and then to um, seed some conversations um, and, and demonstrate some opportunities and then allow people to kind of run with that. So, you know, we, we do think that these opportunities are really value, valuable. Sorry. So, yeah, we want to go ahead, but there is a lot to consider before we really can commit to it as well. How have the local councils been in terms of support levels that you guys have been getting around everything that's sort of happening at the moment? Like, has there been any, any outreach from from that sector? Local council has been fantastic. In the first lockdown, particularly, they were incredible. They came up with significant amount of money for the food effort, which was brilliant. Um, yeah, I think that they've been good partners. They've got, Hamilton City Council has got a really good community development team who are really well connected with the community. And so they've kept um, really, really involved right across the sector um, and, and are feeding back what's happening so that the councillors are aware as well about the impact at a grassroots level. So I think that that's really positive. And we looked we looked around the region after the first lockdown, we certainly could see a difference between councils that had invested in community development um, in terms of teams mm-hmm. and those councils who didn't have community development as a part of their infrastructure. And they significantly lacked the insights into what was happening in their communities. So um, I thought that was really helpful. It's, yeah. Is, is that something that they've, they've looked to fix over the last 18 months? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Waipa District Council, for example, after that lockdown, employed two community development workers, hadn't had them before that. And, and you know, um, our hope is that this time they will have really been able to demonstrate the value of having those people on board and um, as a conduit between the council um, and the community. It must yeah. be a very difficult thing to plan for as well, because nobody knows when the next lockdown is. We, we all kind of no, suspected no. that there would be one at some stage, but yes. it just it's, it, you literally get a message on the radio going, oh, there's a case, and everybody panics, and suddenly you've got to kick into that. It's probably going to happen here. Yeah. So for the organisations that you work with, was there contingency plans put in place after the last lockdown? Yeah. Was there, were, were they sort I of think, prepared for it? I think, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think in terms of people's technology, um, people's systems, um, they were largely in place. Delta has has complicated things a little more. So things like um, the food um, system, getting food to people had to change um, because they needed to heighten things like, um, you know, the PPE gear, the quality of that. Um, the social distancing between their own staff, but also how they would engage with people coming to collect food and, you know, lots of lots of changes um, needing to tweak as a result of the Delta strain. Um, I think the difficulty with, with this lockdown was it was almost kind of rolling, like it happened immediately, right? Yes. We got a little warning about there's one person and then by that night, lockdown but what was difficult was it was kind of like well it'll be three days and then we'll look again and then oh, it'll be another week yeah. and then we'll 
And the difficulty with that is the community groups for a while were kind of like, well, do we mobilize or do we not mobilize? Do we wait until we hear? And so it kind of meant that the action took a little while to kick into gear. We were meeting and talking um, about what might need to happen, <laughs> but it took a little longer to get the actual um, mechanisms in place uh, to, to really start meeting um, the need. And the need came in a little slower. So that was interesting. Oh, okay. Any yeah. idea why that was? Um, I think, again, people were thinking, oh, if it's only three days, we'll probably be fine. Um, but then when it was like, oh, it's another week, you know, then people start getting more and yeah. more concerned about what they have in the pantry. And, you know, yeah. I don't know if the supermarkets up here were anything to go by. Like, like the, the day that it was announced, um, I ran out of milk that morning. And, you know, it's, it was just a normal morning. So I thought I'd call into the supermarket on the way home. And it was insane. It was yeah. absolutely insane. I drove in and out of the car park of the supermarket yeah. and I went, oh, I'll go to my local shops. Yeah, that's what I ended up doing was I, I went yeah. down to the local shops. And then a couple of days later, I went back up to the supermarket to do like the big, the big shop. Yeah. Um, get back home and it, that supermarket showed up on the places of interest list. It was like, oh, oh my God. We're, oh. I'm right in the middle of the Birkdale Social Club cluster. Oh. Like that, that, that's all around me. So like my pizza place, 500 metres up the road is a place of interest. And yeah. my gas station, my supermarket, like it's just, yeah. yeah I, I think they might have fallen off the list now. Oh, because you would feel quite vulnerable um, being yeah. right in that place to even go out and exercise. Yes. Yeah, it, it's been really weird. Like everybody's out and about at the moment. There's lots of people out walking because there's nothing yeah. else they can do. Um, I feel really bad when I go out because I, I have the choice of either being able to see or not being able to see. I either wear my glasses and no mask I, and or I wear a mask I and no glasses. Mean. And I fog yeah. up. Nothing I can do yeah. can stop that. I got so many evils last time I went out there, like evils and side eyes just walking past the dairy, opposite yeah. side of the road to the dairy, and you've got these people lining up out there just going, ah, at you. Yeah. It, yeah. it does feel like it's everyone's judging you because you might be the person who makes them sick because we know yeah. it's right there. Like yeah. It, it's, yeah. 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 And I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm going to try a product for, and if it works for me, I'll, I'll let you know. Um, so it's a couple of things. One is a nose um, clip that oh, goes yes. on top. Yeah, and, yep. and so my, my hope is that that will stop the air coming up under my glasses. Yeah. And the other one is actually a product by New Zealand Protection, which actually is a silicone product that clips into the mask and holds it out from your mouth. So oh. I think part of the problem is that it kind of, you know, everything yeah, is getting here. blown up. Yeah. yeah. Whereas if, if it's holding it out from your mouth a little more, my hope is that it won't go flying up and yeah, fog in the glasses. If it works, yeah. I will let you well, know. Let me know. I was tempted to get like anti-fog spray for goggles and see if that yeah. did the trick. But apparently yeah. that only that, that's only for like, if you've been in chlorine and it starts to strip any coatings that you've got off your glasses. And I didn't, okay. want, to, didn't want to risk that. I do yeah. have some here somewhere, but just yeah, it's not, not going to risk it. So final official question for you before I hit the stop recording button. What advice have you got for people out there going through lockdowns or dealing with, with this kind of pressure on, on how they can get through it and some of the considerations they can put in place to make it better for them? Yeah. Oh, I think, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I think for, for, for me and for the, the advice I keep giving my team when I'm, I'm talking to my staff is that um, to really reflect on what it is that you need, you know, because we all need slightly different things. I know um, I need some physical activity. Um, one of my team members is a gardener and she needs to get out into the garden. Uh, another team member actually wants to sit on the on the couch and watch TV. You know, you, it's about identifying what works for you and not trying to do all the things people say you should be doing and and really looking at what brings you joy, what relaxes you, you know, what what gives you that time out. So, sorry, let me hang that up. <laughs> That's Still right. I've, I've had like three emails come in in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, you know, I talked about enriching behaviours for dogs. I think that we need the same sort of thing for ourselves. And taking those moments, um, 
just before lockdown, I I went and had a play with clay, and I did some I did some pottery, and I hadn't done that for a very long time. But it reminded me how like when I say a long time, I would have been a child. <laughs> but it reminded me of how much I loved that. And then I thought, you know what else I used to love was hearing someone read me a story. I used to love that as a kid. So I ended up going into um, borrow box at the library and downloading an audio book. And so I'm being read to now through an audio book. And actually, it's just really cool. <laughs> so I think it's, it's about being a little bit creative, perhaps, um, and looking for those things that bring you joy and, and spending time doing them. Don't feel guilted into, I should be baking bread. <laughs> you know, I should be walking for three hours. Yeah. I shouldn't be drinking this wine. <laughs> Definitely don't feel guilty about that at the moment. No, no. So <laughs> yeah, it brings you joy. And, and I think um, maintaining those connections with people, and even if that has to be, um, you know, virtually, it's certainly better than, than being isolated. And I think um, I, I love the fact that, that we can speak face to face to people. Can you imagine yeah. if this had happened in the eighties? No, you know? that would have been a nightmare. I would have had to talk to my <laughs> really parents and my siblings. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I mean, this is a whole other way that we can we can stay connected. So yeah, that'd probably be my advice. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Thank Holly for giving up her time on the first day of level two for us. So she could have been out doing just about anything and she chose to sit down with me. So I really do appreciate it. If you want a bit more information about what Community Waikato does, I'll leave a link in the description down below. Feel free to check them out. Give them a hand if you need to. And don't forget, when you're dealing particularly with not-for-profit groups around times like this, it is a bit tougher for them. And so any sort of help that you can offer is probably going to be very much accepted. Until next time, thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed the episode.